Proudly, we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story. As proudly we hail the United States Air Force. Our story today is entitled, When No Birds Fly, as proudly we hail Lieutenant Samuel Green and all the officers and men of the 56th Weather Reconnaissance Squadron, U.S. Air Force, who by flying into, through, and around the most dangerous storms, make it possible for others to fly in safety. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment. Young man, as an Air Force aviation cadet, you can be flying the fastest, most modern jets within 18 months. Jets are easy to fly, safe too, when you learn the aviation cadet way. The Air Force spares no pains to give its future pilots the finest, most thorough aviation training in the world. It's not easy work by any means. It takes a good man to make the grade, but the rewards are well worth it. Here's what you get when you complete your training. The silver wings of an Air Force lieutenant, earning more than $5,000 a year and an unlimited opportunity for leadership in the jet age. If you're interested in a career of flying, begin as an aviation cadet. To qualify, you must be between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, single, be a high school graduate, in excellent health. For further details, visit your local United States Air Force recruiting station immediately. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, When No Birds Fly. Weather is always an important factor in the planning and execution of aerial warfare. To overcome the dangers and limitations of weather to successful air operations, the United States has developed an all-weather air force designed to operate effectively under the most difficult of weather conditions. It takes men of courage to fly in the face of such conditions, and this is such a story of the men of the Air Force who pit their knowledge and courage against the howling wind and pelting rain that spells typhoon. It's a warm, sunny day in the officers' quarters at Yokota Air Force Base near Tokyo. Lieutenant Samuel Green and his family have just sat down to breakfast. P, don't play with your cereal. Eat it like a man. But it's not the kind I like. What kind do you like, son? The kind that jet pilots eat. Oh. In this house, we eat the kind that typhoon hunters eat, so dig in. <laughs> oh, you know, sitting in a nice kitchen like this, eating food from the States, it's hard to realize we're so far away. Sam, I love living here. Never forget when you got your orders for Japan how we wondered whether Pete and I should follow you. I'm glad we did. Mm -hmm, so am I. And then when the war in Korea started, the Air Force said Pete and I had the option of staying or going home. I'm also glad you wanted us to stay. Well, how would I have gotten along without the two of you? You can still say that after being married almost ten years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, then there's my wonderful seven-year-old son. Am I wonderful, Pop? Mm hmm you are when you eat your cereal and do what your mother tells you. And when you don't, uh, well, sometimes I think I'll trade you in for a new model. You mean sometimes you feel like I'm a B-29 and you'd rather have a jet? <laughs> ah, your father loves his plane, Pete. He'd never want to fly anything else. Oh, and I'd never really want to trade you for anyone else either. Remember that. I love you very much. Do you love Mommy? You know I do, son. I love you both. Why do you think I fly Glamour Girl for the 56th Weather Recon Squadron? For us, Pop. Mm -hmm, that's right, for you. I wish you'd fly a jet for us, Pop. Pete, I think you're getting too jet happy. Yeah, he's sure getting too jet something. My teacher said that jets are the planes of today and tomorrow. Propellers are things of the past. Oh, he did, did he? Uh, uh, Sam, take it easy. 
Besides, the teacher's a she, not a he. Oh, I see. Well, that explains the remark like that. She's right, though, isn't she, Pa? She is not. Where would those jet jockeys be without us? How do you think a jet would make out in a typhoon? You think it would last very long? It would not. Gee, Pop, don't get mad. He's right, Sam. Yes, of course he's right. Sometimes when I hear nothing but jets, it gets my goat. I'm sorry, Pete. That's okay, Pop. I'm sorry, too. Gosh, it's late. I better get going to school. Uh, don't forget your lunch and take your coat. Ah, oh, gee, Mom, it's almost July. I don't need a coat. Pete, it's June, 1952, and you're only seven years old. Now, when you're more grown up, then you can decide for yourself. Okay, Pop. Bye, Mom. Bye. So long, Pop. So long. Gee, why couldn't you fly a jet instead of that big old B-29? <laughs> well, there goes the jet jockey of the future. Yeah, here goes the typhoon hunter of the present. Uh, don't forget, I won't be home for supper tonight. I know. The buzzards of the 56th Recon Squadron are flying. Roger. <laughs> Come home safe, darling. You know I will. For you. Della, how would you like it? Uh, like what? To be married to a jet pilot. <laughs> Remember your Buzzard King won. Up until now, the 54th on Guam has had charge of Typhoon Gypsy Rose. But she's in our area now. This first penetration must be accurate. There's a big bomber effort due tomorrow, and if Gypsy Rose should change course and head for Japan, we've got to know it. Well, the way she's heading right now, looks like she's going to miss Japan by a couple of hundred miles. And aside from penetrating Gypsy Rose, stick to your regular weather track. To Okinawa at 18,000... West of the China coast, dropping down slowly to 1,500. North along the coast to the 38th parallel. East across the Yellow Sea. North Korea and the Sea of Japan at 18,000. Then south and home. Zero hour is 1,700. Now, don't forget to check your escape and evasion gear. The Reds have a large concentration of anti-aircraft batteries at once on now. If anything should happen, I want you to be prepared. Roger. And remember, if you see any MiGs, run. Don't walk. That one twin fifty you have in the tail wouldn't help much. Now, that's all. Briefing's over. Coming, Sam. Hey, I'll be along in a minute. I want to talk to Hank. Oh, those bridge players. Always arguing about the hand that got away. <laughs> I know, Sam. Kay should have finessed those. Shoot me. Oh, you did your best. Uh, sure wasn't good enough. Down four double. Who? Uh, Hank, if someone in the outfit wanted to transfer to jet training, what would you say? Oh, I'd hate to lose one man from this outfit. You know that. Uh, you old sentimentalist. Oh, no, it's more than that. The 56 is a well-trained, smooth-functioning unit. A new man to be trained, broken in? Well, it disrupt us more than you realize. Yeah, I suppose it would. Sam, it isn't you. How's Betty, Hank? Well, she's fine, Sam, but how are you? Who is it? Hank Brakely, Della. Oh, what a surprise after that down four double last night. <laughs> Come on in. You want some coffee? Yeah, I just finished eating. Uh, are you just returning that baking tin in your hand, or is there something else, Hank? Is it about Sam? I don't know, Della. That's what I wanted to talk about. Well, go ahead, Hank. We've been friends long enough to talk honestly. Well, after the briefing today, Sam came over to me and asked me what I'd do if someone in the outfit wanted to transfer to jet training. Oh. When I asked him if he was the one who was thinking of the move, he changed the subject. Has he said anything to you? Uh, not right out, but this morning as he was leaving, he asked me how I'd like to be married to a jet pilot. Mm. Then it must be Sam. Do you know why, Della? This is going to sound silly, but I think it's Pete. Little Pete? What's he got to do with it? A few months ago, Pete suddenly got uh, jet happy. At breakfast, lunch, dinner, that's all he talked about. I, I think it's been getting on Sam's nerves. Hmm. This morning, for the first time, he blew up at Pete about it. You see, I think Sam wants Pete to look up to him. He he wants him to feel about the 56th and Glamour Girl the way he does. Mm, I see. Maybe Sam's beginning to think that I feel the way Pete does or that Pete feels that way because of me. No, I'm sure he doesn't, but... Say, I've got an idea if you'll go along with me. Where's Pete now? It's cool. He should be out in a few minutes. And then he'll probably ride the school bus over to Johnson Air Base, where some jets are. He's not going to get there today, Della, if you let me pick him up and take him to my place. Oh, 
course I will, Hank. I'm going to try and get permission to take him to the radio room tonight so he can listen in on one of his father's missions. You know, maybe if he actually hears all about what Glamour Girl and his father do, he'll get those jets off his mind. It'd be wonderful if he did. And then it's all right with you? It's more than all right. I just hope it works. <laughs> so do I. Sam's one of the best pilots and one of the best bridge opponents I've ever had. <laughs> Have enough supper, Pete? Sure. Uh, hear that? That's a message from your father's plane. Do you get messages from jets? Oh, your dad's probably near Okinawa now. The plane's been sending in weather reports every hundred miles since it took off. Have they seen any mid? Oh, no, no, not yet. They can't possibly have seen any of those until they get over North Korea. That'll be much later. It's pretty late now. I think it's my bedtime. Say, that's right. Hey, I forgot to tell you, Pete. I talked to your mother, and she said you're almost a man now, and you can stay up tonight as late as you wanted. Gee, Uncle Hank, I grew up to be a man pretty quick, didn't I? <laughs> Getting all the weather reports out, Jim? Yep, sure thing, George. Every hundred miles. When you fly him, it's a snap. Wind seems to be picking up. We must be getting near the typhoon. According to our radar, she's up ahead about 10 miles. She's got me worried now. Worried? Why? She's off course. I can't be sure until we get into her, but I've got a feeling she's heading straight for Japan. Say, by the way, we got our 75th consecutive drop sound off without incident a while back. Those things never cease to amaze me. Yeah, you weather guys have a wonderful device in that miniature weather station hung on a parachute. Release it, and as it floats down, it sends up messages on the weather. Pretty terrific little gadget. We're supposed to have a thermos of coffee on board. Anybody know where it is? Yeah, it's right behind you on the shelf, George. Hey, uh, look up ahead there. Even in this dim light, you can see what a mean old girl that Gypsy Rose is. Wow. Man, oh, man. I can never get used to the way a plane reacts to those first few gusts of a typhoon. Better buzz the crew to fasten themselves in and batten down, Sam. Gypsy Rose is very much with us. Roger. Pilot the crew. Fasten safety belts. I'm going to need your help on these controls, Sam. It looks like Gypsy Rose is going to be a big, bad girl. I sure wish we could pick the weak spot of these typhoons when we go in like we can when we come out. We could if we had the time and the fuel to go all the way around her and probe with our radar, but she might be quite a few hundred miles in circumference. Wind velocity's up to 125. Hey, Jim, can you reach that thermos jug? It's bouncing around like a 20-pound rock coming down a mountain. That strap must have come loose. Yeah, yeah, sure, I'll try. Hey, George, look out the thermos. Oh. George! George! Jim, that jug caught George in the head. I think he's out. Can you get to him? Yeah, I'll, I'll take care of George. You pilot this fucking Bronco. Right. You're rich, Sam. Oh, brother, this Gypsy Rose is the worst. Yeah, not kidding. I, I think George is all right, but he's going to have an awful big bump on his head. The wind is getting worse. Don't I know it? I don't know if I can hold it. I'm going to alert the crew to prepare for emergency. <laughs> Now, you hold her. George is still unconscious. He'll never get out of the plane if we have to ditch now. Come on, you glamour girl. Come on, old girl. This is just another routine flight. Come on, glamour girl. Hold it, glamour girl. <laughs> You are listening to the proudly we hail production, When No Birds Fly. We will return in just a moment for the second act. The Blue Yonder, a challenge today more than ever before. The best pilots, the fastest planes, the most up-to-date technical skill. How would you like the thrill of meeting the challenge of today's Blue Yonder? As a pilot in the United States Air Force, you'll fly some of the most famous planes in the world the Sabrejet, the Starfire, the Thunderjet, and others. To qualify as a pilot of these renowned aircraft, 
to take your place among today's conquerors of the sky, you would undergo 16 months of rugged, thorough flying training. When you graduate, you'll be a second lieutenant with the silver wings of an Air Force pilot, and you'll be earning more than $5,000 a year. Now, you are eligible to apply if you're between 19 and 26 and a half, single, in excellent health, and meet the mental and educational requirements. You can get more information from the Air Force base nearest you or your nearest United States Air Force recruiting station. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of our story, When No Birds Fly. On the ground, the WB-29 Glamour Girl, the W stands for weather, is a big airplane. But in the air, when it's being buffeted by typhoon winds up to 150 miles an hour and lashed by stinging rain, it is tossed around like a little toy. And while the plane's crew fights its battle with the weather, on the ground back home, the wives and children wait. Sometimes the waiting can be worse than the flying, for there's nothing to do but sit and hope that the phone will ring or the door will open, and that special man will say, I'm home. Well, I hope that husband of mine's taking good care of Pete. <laughs> I'm sure he is. You want some more coffee? Thanks, although I already feel like a coffee bean. <laughs> you don't know how I appreciate you staying with me tonight, Pity. Nonsense. No appreciation required. We're friends, aren't we? We're going to be awfully tired friends tomorrow. Well, if Hank's plan works, then it was worth it a thousand times over. It's got to work. Sam loves the 56. He loves Glamour Girl. He loves his work. He doesn't really want to fly Jeff. We know that. But he wants his son to think he's the greatest guy in the world, which is perfectly natural for a father. And Pete's going through the jet phase. Maybe it's some of the kids at school. Their fathers fly jets and they tease Pete about B-29s. I think you might speak to his teacher. I already have. She'll be all right from now on. Uh, how about some canasta? I couldn't now. I'm too nervous. I wonder how Sam is. It is strange, but I have a feeling he's in trouble. Stella, that's imagining. Well, maybe. I I'm going to call operations. You know they won't be able to tell you anything. Well, then I'll call Hank in the radio room. Oh, come on, Della. Relax. Everything's all right. Let's see now. Uh... Oh, here it is. Three, two, one. Okay. Blessings on the base phone directory. Oh, hello, radio room? Uh, Captain Brakely, please. No, but he should be there with a the young boy. Yes, I'll wait. Now, this is one of the times when I'm glad Hank's on the ground. H hello, Hank? Oh. Oh, I see. No, nothing important. If you get the chance, will you tell him that Mrs. Green called? No, he'll know what it's about. That's all, thanks. What's up? Betty, I'm scared. There must be something wrong with the glamour girl. The man said that Hank's too busy to come to the phone. He might really be too busy, you know. But he isn't. He's off duty. He, he's just sitting there as an observer. I'm sure of it. He wouldn't talk to me because he has bad news. He may not want to frighten Pete, but something's happened to Sam. <laughs> Uncle Hank. Uh, oh, uh, nobody important, Pete. Oh, I thought maybe it was Mommy. Say, that's quite a storm your father's flying through now. You know, no jet would try to fly in that kind of weather. Is he really flying all by himself now? Is the pilot still hurt? He sure is. Captain Holloway is still pretty groggy, and now it's up to your father. Gee. You remember what a typhoon is like, don't you, Pete? We had a bad one here last September? Sure. Lots of wind and rain. It took part of the roof off the school. And we all got a holiday for two days. That was fun. But that typhoon wasn't. Well, that's what your father's flying through. I'm afraid they're having a pretty rough time. Oh, I'm not worried, Uncle Hank. You're not? No. If my pop's flying that plane, everything's going to turn out all right. <laughs> How's George getting along? Oh, he's fine. He's got one big headache. Well, we finished circling the eye of this, baby. You about through with the weather end? 
Roger. I've got the radar man looking for the weak spot so we can get out easy. I don't want another trip out like the one we had in. Well, even flying through the weak spot can be tough. Hope we can make it. After the flying I saw you do just a little while ago, Sam. I believe you can get through anything. Hey, hi, George. Hi. You didn't have to get up. How are you feeling, Pappy? Oh, I feel strangely like I'd been hit on the head by a gallon jug full of coffee. <laughs> yeah, Jim tells me you got quite a lump back there. A little bigger, and people would be mistaking me for the original two-headed boy. <laughs> <laughs> you feel like flying? Oh, you'd better take her out of Gypsy Rose if you can, Sam. I'm still a little rocky. I should be okay for the easy stuff after that. Radar man says weak spot is up just ahead. Pilot to crew. Pilot to crew. Recheck safety belts. I say again, recheck safety belts. We're getting out of here. Feels funny sitting in this seat again after that knock, Jim. Right behind you, Pappy. Do me a favor and check the position of that thermos, will you? If we lose Sam, we don't need a plane. We'll all be sprouting private wings of our own. <laughs> Feeling well enough to keep on flying? Stop worrying, Samson. Outside of a slight headache, I'm as good as new. Well, we'll be over North Korea in a few minutes. Yeah. With this full moon and no clouds, we'll be sitting ducks at 18,000 feet. Well, when they planned these weather tracks, there wasn't any anti-aircraft fire. Now the commies have this whole Wonsan area bracketed with ACAC. Besides being a weatherman, you should know best of all that you have to take readings at certain heights... Over specific areas for real accurate reports. Come on, come on, you guys. I was only kidding in the first place. The Yellow Sea's as calm as plate glass. Look, there's the Korean coast up ahead. Well, me for some coffee. How about you two? Uh, seeing as how it practically killed me before, maybe I ought to give it a chance to do me some good now. <laughs> how about you, Jim? Might as well. A lot of work for me still ahead. Yeah, and since part of it's over Korea, with lots of nice heavy ack ack, this is one crew that really has to be on the ball. There's one sun up ahead. The moon may light us up, but it sure makes it possible for us to see them, too. Well, I'd rather fly through anti-aircraft than through Gypsy Rose again. You know darn well we'll be doing both soon enough. Maybe it won't be Gypsy Rose, but it's sure to be some old typhoon. It's typhoon time in old Dakota. Yeah. yeah, I know it, and although I wouldn't admit it to anyone but you, I love it. It's a challenge, you know. When you land, you feel like you've really done a job. Which, if you'll pardon my saying so, you really have. And which the younger generation just doesn't seem to understand. What's that? Oh, nothing, George. I'm just talking to myself. Uh-oh. Bang, bang, boys have started their serenade. Yeah, they seem to have our range pretty well, too. It's about time they realize that the 56th flies over here at the same height every time. Well, you know something? I just as soon they hadn't figured it out. Sure is mighty close. George, we're hit. I think it's the right wing. You all right, Pappy? Roger. Look, number four engine starting to smoke. He's on fire. Feather engine. Closed cow flaps turn on fire extinguisher. Emergency procedure complete. On the ball, baby. Without number four, we sure slow down. Fire seems to be gaining, Sam. Yeah, well, here goes for the alarm bell. Pilot to crew. Pilot to crew. Prepare to jump. I say again, prepare to jump. Number four is on fire. If the fire continues to gain, I'm afraid we're going to make lots of use of that escape and evasion gear. Oh, which reminds me, just where did I put mine? <laughs> mission to have Pete down here for. Hello, Uncle Hank. I must have fallen asleep. Yeah, I guess you did. Will my daddy be home soon? Gee, it's beginning to get light out. Yeah, yeah, it's another day, all right. Is my daddy almost home? Hey, did you ever see the sun come up before, Pete? Why won't you answer me, Uncle Hank? Answer you what? I asked you twice if daddy was almost home. And twice you talked about something else. 
Fire out. Plane okay. Winging home. <laughs> it's all right now, Pete. It's all right. Your daddy's coming home. Look at that engine and that engine calling. The fire really came close to getting out of control. Gosh, Uncle Hank, I guess my father's a hero. Yes, I guess they all are. The crew did a great job. Hey, hey, Pete, where you going? Hey, come back here, you little scab. I've got to see my daddy, because he's a hero. You did a great job, Sam. Thanks for taking over. And it didn't do so bad yourself with that head. Hey, you better get yourself x-rayed. That was quite a clout. Daddy! Huh? Daddy! Hey, isn't that your youngster running over here? Yeah, it sure is. I wonder what he's doing at the field. Daddy, you're a hero. I heard you, Daddy. You saved the glamour girl. What do you mean, Pete? You heard me. Uncle Hank took me to the radio room. I was up all night. I heard all about the thermos jug and the typhoon and the guns and the fire and everything. You're a hero, Daddy. I think you're wonderful. Do you really, Pete? I'm not going to fly a jet. I want to fly a B-29 when I grow up. I want to be like you. Daddy, does the glamour girl need a mascot? I don't know, son, maybe. Would you like to be it? Gee, and how? That would be better than being the bad boy for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Ask any jet pilot, and he'll tell you there's no thrill in the world like flying a jet, cleaving through the sky at the speed of sound, pushing against the outer limits of space, blazing the way to a new air future. Yes, it's an exciting life, one that offers unlimited opportunities to young men of ambition and vision. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, single and a high school graduate, a wonderful future in jet aviation is open to you. Become an Air Force aviation cadet you'll be flying jets easily and safely within 18 months. Aviation cadet training is rough and rigorous, but the rewards are worth it. You graduate as an Air Force lieutenant, earning more than $5,000 a year with a promising career ahead of you. Yes, you'll be a man fully equipped for positions of responsibility in the fields of military and commercial aviation. Guarantee your future as an aviation cadet. See your recruiter today at your local United States Air Force recruiting station. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Mark Hamilton speaking, inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>